Our first highlighted speaker today is Paul Sheets. Paul grew up in West Central Illinois on a family farm and graduated from the University of Illinois with a finance degree in 2010. Paul's current role is the Director of Climate Smart Ag Origination for Archer Daniels Midland, where he works with ADM's origination and sales team to design, execute, and manage ADM's North American regenerative ag programs. Prior to Paul's current role, he held various commercial management roles with ADM, focusing on managing ADM's grain buying and ingredient sales at various processing facilities. North Harvest Bean Growers welcomes to Bean Day 2024, Paul Sheets. Morning, everybody. I might do a little pace in here, so I'm going to grab this mic. Um, I appreciate the introduction. My uh, responsibilities with ADM, we're very proud of our edible dry bean business. I work on our sustainability and regenerative agriculture side that's all farmer facing. But before I get into that, I wanted to give a little bit longer introduction of my background. Uh, as was mentioned, I grew up in a farm in West Central Illinois. Uh, it's a row crop and a hog farm question for the crowd. I know we have a lot of edible dry bean farmers here. Do we have any hog farmers here? Hand raise? None. Smart group of farmers in this crowd. Um, but at an early age, I, uh, I worked pretty hard on that farm. I'd be one of those guys that I think was focused a little bit more on other responsibilities. So uh, I always give, uh, whenever any of my colleagues ask the question, why, don't, why didn't you go back to the farm? I answer, that I was actually fired from the farm. And I have a few different stories of how that came about, but I'm gonna share with you guys the last story. Um, I was probably 17 years old. It was myself and a couple of my buddies. We needed to move hogs from one location to the other. They'd gotten to a certain size where they were over capacity in the confinement buildings that they were at. Uh, like I said a little bit before, I think I worked hard, but my, um, my head was maybe in other spots of worrying about football practice or basketball practice. We had to lo load up this gooseneck trailer with about 100 hogs, I think they were 80 pound hogs, um, and move them from one location to the other. We got them all loaded up, moved the truck up a little bit, uh, had to bounce around at a couple other locations to finish up some work. By the time myself and a couple of our buddies got back to the trailer, we looked, that gate was wide open, there wasn't a single hog in the back of those trucks. I still remember having to make that phone call to my dad uh, of being able to get all my brothers and my sisters and everybody else that was working on the farm because you had 100 pigs scattered throughout our bean fields and our corn fields. And they're like the worst weight too. If they were 30 pound pigs, they'd be easy to pick up. If they were 200 pound pigs, you could sort them in the back of the trailer, but they were 70 to 80 pound pigs that you had to pick up. It turned into a whole day event. Pretty costly experience for my dad. And even though my dad's not a mean-spirited guy. I still remember the conversation we had at the end of the day. He's an honest, he's a transparent fella. And he looked me in the face and he said, I think it's gonna be better for my bottom line and your bottom line if you go get a different job. And now I'm gonna talk about sustainability with you guys here for ADM. Uh, you guys hear a lot of buzz terms uh, in the marketplace. It's sustainably sourcing, it is regenerative agriculture sourcing, it is climate smart sourcing. Um, I think uh, we're still in early days in all those categories, but the one thing I wanted to do today was kind of talk from an ADM lens about the journey that we've been on over the last 10 years, uh, where we've came from, what we've learned, where we currently sit at, and what we see the future as well. And uh, the one thing that I get by kind of living in this space every single day for the last few years is a little bit more clarity on what the market is trying to say when they're talking about sustainably sourced or regenerative sourced or climate smart sourced. I feel like we're trying to get to a little bit more of a concrete definition. Whenever we're talking about sustainability, it usually covers a lot of different categories. It's not just environmental. There's a social component to it. There's a compliance component to it. There's a best practice component to it. There's um, employee welfare within our organization, community involvement covers like seven different buckets. But then when we, um, uh, when the term regenerative agriculture came out, you could tell we're starting to drill down into one of those sub buckets. And that's environmental impacts of farming practices. 
uh, whether that is biodiversity impacts, water quality impacts, soil health Im impacts, or even carbon impacts. And then when the USDA came out with their climate smart definition uh, a couple years ago, I feel like we're drilling down into regenerative ag even a little bit more where we're specifically focused uh, on climate and carbon, but not ignoring some of those other impacts. Um, and that's one thing that we've learned over the years. A little bit of background from an ADM perspective, perspective is what we do really well is we buy grain, we handle grain, we store it, we process it, we set markets. We've been doing that for roughly 120 years, but we're not agronomic experts whatsoever. So in 2012, we started a couple different pilot projects uh, with some of our downstream customers as well, Unilever at the time, General Mills, PepsiCo, of trying to engage farmers on understanding what their field level practices were uh, and what decisions are being made and how much those vary region by region. And we found out really early of doing that over a five year period that there isn't a standard operating procedure, point one. Every piece of ground is slightly different. North Dakota edible beans are completely different than Illinois corn. Um, and that means that it's gotta have a little bit more sophisticated strategy on understanding what continuous improvement could be. We also identified some really strong trends from U.S. farmers. Whenever you're talking about regenerative agriculture or even climate smart agriculture, there tends to be three general practices um, that uh, companies like ourselves could incentivize um, or are focusing on. It's tillage, it's fertilizer efficiency, it's cover crop adoption. If you look over the last 40 years, the U.S. farmers' adoption of these practices have all been as significant. Let's take tillage as an example. 1977, the U.S. farmer represented less than 1 million acres of no-till. Fast, and this is reported by NAS. Fast forward to 2017, now the U.S. farmer uh, 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 reports 102 million acres of no-till annually, an increase of 100 million acres over a 40-year period. Cover crop adoption really didn't exist in large scale prior to 2000. There was 11 or less than a million acres that was reported by NAS. 2020, it was reported that there's 20 million acres in the U.S. That's still a relatively small number. Cover crops don't work everywhere. They don't work on every single field. You've seen a significant uptick in the last 10 years. Then take fertilizer efficiency. In 1980, the EPA reported that commercial fertilizer use in the U.S. was 24 million metric tons. Fast forward to 2015, and the EPA reported that commercial use of fertilizer was 22 million metric tons, 2 million metric tons le less over that period. And then the showstopper, whenever we're talking about sustainability or region ag, which is less inputs or more production on the same amount of uh, acres, over, between 1977 and 2020, we have doubled production of, over, of our overall principal crops and reduced the amount of land that we farm from 330 million acres to 310 million acres. So all four of those metrics we, 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 we had essentially solidified during our pilot projects where we knew from an ADM perspective the U.S. farmer is sustainable. The only, we don't want to dictate practices by any means, we just want to accelerate the adoption of those practices by being able to get private funds and technical assistance support during that time. The other thing that we figured out from an ADM perspective there are certain things we're good at and there are certain things that we're weak at. So we have to make sure that we have partnerships that help us with these offerings of these programs. In 2017 in Des Moines, Iowa, we had gathered roughly 450,000 acres of field level information. And at that time, there was only 15,000 acres of cover crops that were represented. We had partnered with a company called Practical Farmers of Iowa who'd spent the better part of the last 20 years giving advice on conservation ag. Um, and of those 15,000 acres, the farmers that we were talking to were very passionate about the subject matter. Um, and I remember sitting in the meetings uh, with our downstream customer at the time, and we were wanting to change our program and just incentivize on cover crops. And again, cover crops don't work everywhere. Um, but when that was said in those meetings, I come from a farm in West Central Illinois, my dad didn't plant cover crops. I knew that it was only a small percentage. I said, there's no freaking way this is going to work at the scale that we thought we were going to. That was in 2018, only 15,000 acres were represented. If you fast forward to this year, we're gonna have 240,000 acres in that same area that are planting cover crops in that area. So there's a little bit of surprise, but uh, there's two leading contributors to that overall programs. The partners that we ultimately um, uh, partnered with uh, to have the conversations with farmers, not only the practical farmers of Iowa, but also 
those farmers that were the early adopters of those practices to be able to share best practices. Because as you guys all know, in almost every single farmer meeting that we sit in, we can have an NRCS representative, we can have a university expert, you can have an ADM person talking, crowd gets relatively quiet, but then when you have a farmer panel talking about operations and practices, that's when it's a lot more active. Um, so we make sure that in each one of our regions, we wanna partner with some of the early adopters of these practices that can speak the common language of other farmers in that area. We have expanded our overall partnerships with the technical assistance partners, Practical Farmers of Iowa isn't the only one we also partner with American Farmland Trust, Ducks Unlimited, Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, Kansas Association of Conservation Districts, Flint River Soil and Water Conservation Districts. We try to be as local as possible so that the advice is given understanding the complexities of the farming regions in that time. The other thing that we understood is um, that to ultimately be able to report the impacts associated with the practices that we wanted to focus on, we had to make sure that we were getting good, solid data uh, to report on. And we know that is the number one annoyance uh, from a farmer perspective. We want, that they wanna spend, of course, more time actually on the farm than being able to give information that they've probably already given two or three times to FSA offices. And over that time, we had worked with several different partners um, uh, to collect the data. It's a big pinch point. We didn't want it to take four hours, five hours, 10 instances. We wanted to try to make it as uh, easy and painless as possible. And usually when we're trying to report these outcomes, there is a model or there is a methodology uh, that's tied to it that doesn't always speak um, realistic farm language. So we have partnered with several different technology companies to collect that data, but most recently we've, we've partnered with Farmers Business Network that has created a front-end platform that speaks a little bit more commonly uh, on trying to identify the practices that each farmer um, is executing and trying to do it in a quick fashion so we can ultimately get all the outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, uh, just wanna uh, just clarify that um, through that time, partnerships were critical, and it wasn't only the technical assistance partners that was the PFI and the American Farmland Trust or the technology partners. Another big partner during that time was Field to Market. Um, at the end of the day, if this is going to be successful, there ha it can't just be a compliance exercise. It has to be a commercial opportunity across the whole supply chain from farmer to grain handler to end user as well. And to do that, you have to make sure that you have metrics that are um, founded in research and solid re research and field to market was there in the early days in 2012 to create the metrics that were ultimately needed around these farming practices and the benchmarks that we were looking uh, to accomplish as well. Um, so they were really critical uh, during all of those steps. Um, just checking my notes here really quick. So this year we, in the last two years from uh, ADM has really scaled up our efforts on um, going from pilot projects that you would see from 2012 to 2017 to larger scale offerings and premiums to farmers and technical assistance support. Last year, we were able to uh, originate over 1 million acres that covered roughly 1,800 farmers. This year, we are finishing up our enrollment period where we should be somewhere around 2.5 million acres and 3,000 growers, of which we do have 147,000 acres uh, in North Dakota. Today, the offering in North Dakota is just focused on wheat, but part of our um, Climate Smart Commodities grant that we have received is doing some of that similar work we did in Des Moines, Iowa, and North Dakota on wheat and Kansas on wheat with Field to Market to be able to develop the metrics and the benchmarks around edible dry beans uh, because it will be a new commodity for us here this year. So we have a little bit of work to do, but we fully expect by this time next year um, that we have an offering around edible dry beans. But we have a lot of work to do, both on the field to market side and then also coordination with farmers in this area. Um, but hopefully by this time next year, we will have an offer. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was some of the marketing dynamics, not just on edible dry beans, but also on several other commodities. I mentioned to you guys that I've been in this space for the better part of, um, four or five years, and I can tell you I had a chance to sit down with a lot of markets, whether it's governments, whether it's our downstream customers, um, whether it's government entities three to four to five years ago, and everybody was interested in funding or in um, supporting uh, 
regenerative agriculture programs or climate smart programs, but there wasn't a big appetite to ultimately fund the programs. And as everybody knows, it's got to have a commercial opportunity. There are real production risks or cost risks that are associated with adopting a lot of these practices, whether it's conservation tillage, whether it's a robust fertilizer efficiency program, cover crop adoption, edge of field practices, et cetera, that uh, funding is absolutely needed. But that has significantly changed over the last 24 months. In our space, we buy, store, and process agriculture commodities that go into the food space, feed space, industrial space, and in the fuel space. And I can tell you that all four of them are pushing uh, in a positive direction to be able to provide funds uh, that help offset those productivity and those cost concerns around those practices. Uh, if you take the fuel space as an example, there's been two developments over the last two years. Um, one of them is uh, that uh, any fuel that is exported into Europe um, has to have sustainability certification that's tied to it, um, uh, which usually has you know, an ISCC certification or an RTRS certification, but essentially what it comes down to is asking you if you guys are farming legally, which if you give information to the FSA, more than likely the answer is yes, uh, and then also asking what field level information you guys are executing, uh, then final, um, final productivity of that crop, and then with that certification, then you can um, obviously participate in the market in Europe. It's called the Red 3 Initiative, uh, slightly different than what we've seen in the past. You've also here recently had, um, if you guys are familiar with the IRA tax bill, uh, it has not been finalized at this point, but there was two really big opportunities. One of them is that they increased their overall budget around EQIP, CSP, and RCPP dollars. Uh, that you can get uh, within the FSA office. I think it was $20 billion over five years. But there's a really interesting component to it of also identifying the carbon intensity of ethanol and biodiesel that inc includes field level emissions, which is something that's never been done uh, in the US. And when it comes to fuel, why agriculture-based fuel has been more attractive than petroleum-based fuel is that the carbon intensity level is already lower. If you look at whole numbers, diesel and gasoline, the numbers that they usually indicate are somewhere around 90 grams per megajoule. And on average, um, most of the ethanol that's produced that's, that comes from corn feedstock is in that 65 to 70 range. Biodiesel from soybeans is in that 55 range. So you're starting off below. But there is also a component to it that if you take variable field level scoring into effect, into effect then scores can be even lower. Today, and most of the markets that have been created, whether it's a low carbon fuel standard in California um, or REN programs that you have federally as well, farmers are just given a default value that is the average of what the assumed field level practices are in the US. The number of all of those numbers that I had shared before on corn is like 29 grams per megajoule. That being said, if you have a no-till program or you have a fertilizer efficiency program or you happen to plant a cover crop before the corn crop, then your number can get as low as 15 or even zero that could take that overall carbon intensity score lower. And in the IRA tax bill, there seems to be a window to where variable field level scoring could go into effect and more premiums on the grain you deliver. Now, there is a lot of question marks around IRA 45Z. There are a lot of decisions that ultimately have to be made over the next three to four to six months. Um, but that's another opportunity that didn't exist uh, a couple months ago. Uh, in the food space, again, that's, that's probably where I spent the majority of my time over the last five years, and um, you've definitely seen an increase of uh, commitments uh, from companies, ADM included. Uh, we have announced our, uh, what we call our scope three emissions. It's all around greenhouse gas emissions. I do not want to get too technical in this conversation. But just understand almost every product that we make for the better part of the last three to five years, and ADM isn't alone on this, we're doing inventory checks of what the energy that we use at our processing facilities or grain, hand grain handling facilities may be, along with everything that goes into the end product that we ultimately make. And the biggest contributor today is what we call scope three emissions or 
field level emissions uh, to the overall emission profile. Now that's not a negative thing, that's a positive thing um, because we have a huge opportunity. Uh, we've leaned on farmers for food security in the 1980s, fuel security in the early 2000s, and now there's a really big opportunity on carbon security as well. Um, but um, a lot of that inventory accounting has happened over the last three to four years, us and other companies uh, included, and commitments have been made uh, to reduce those overall emissions by a certain years, 2030, 2035. Uh, so the amount of downstream customers uh, that have showed interest uh, in this space, A, because it's the right thing to do, B, because there's a differentiation component to it, C, because a lot of the practices lead to a more resilient crop, and a more resilient crop leads to steadier commodities uh, over, over several years. And then, and then the last piece is that the commitments have ultimately been made that it seems like there's an increased opportunity for funding sources in the overall space. And we've seen that drastically increase over the last two or three or four years. Um, I talked about climate or compliance markets a little bit more as well. Um, uh, IRA we covered as well. And then another big item that happened over the last 12 months was that the USDA put out um, uh, their Climate Smart Commodities Grant. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm speaking to you guys today, because ADM was awarded um, some of the funds from the Climate Smart Commodities Grant. But they had put out, I think, it, I think it's $3.3 billion total to try to add an environmental attribute to the agriculture ingredients that are ultimately sold into the, um, in, in, into the industry. And uh, so there's several different participants, award winners. I know there was uh, 70 in the first round, and I think there was another couple hundred in the second round that will be offering programs around incentivizing uh, regenerative agriculture practices or climate smart practices that could include several different things that you should see pop up. Uh, but with all those uh, tailwinds that we've seen over the last just two years, if you just take like a trend analysis of what you expect over the next two or three years, you can see that there's going to be uh, even more opportunities as we move forward. Um, you guys might ask, the one thing I didn't say from the very beginning, but if, if anybody has a question at any point in time, farming's hard, this subject matter um, is new, there's a lot of noise that's associated with it as well. There are no silly questions at any point in time. So if anybody has any questions when I'm talking, feel free to raise your hand. I know it's a big group. I imagine I won't get a lot of questions, but if you do have one, um, I'll address it so you don't forget about it, and I'm going to give like 10 minutes at the very end uh, for questions as well. I'm going to pause for like two seconds just to make sure there aren't any questions in the crowd from what I've covered so far. One big question that I have is a much smaller processor over here, right here. Okay. in comparison to ADM is as we look at what's happening in this space is how do you define your metrics, how do you choose your metrics, and then build a reporting system from that because the way I look at sustainability and regenerative and everything else in this space is if you can't apply a number to it, if you can't show continued measurable growth, you're not really doing it. So what was what was ADM's tactic in that? Yeah, great question. Do you mind giving a quick introduction to the crowd? Oh, my name's Charles Walks. I'm with Chippewa Valley Bean. Okay. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. So from like your perspective, like we, like we started from an ADM perspective, you have to be really honest with yourself on what your goals and your objectives are. Because the one thing about this space is you can swallow an elephant really, really quickly. There are a lot of different items that you could focus on, whether it's carbon, biodiversity, land use change, water quality, soil health, compliance type of questions on employee welfare that I think what we started off with is what is our focus? What is our like pecking order? Of course, we wanna solve all the problems as much as we possibly can, but where is our first focus? So once you identify what that is, I think it's a little bit easier to come up with metrics because if you try to have six different metrics that you're focusing on, every action has a reaction. So you could have a integrated pest management program on the pesticide herbicide side that has a positive impact on pesticide or herbicide use, but has a negative impact on maybe tillage practices at the same time. So starting off with what your core two or core three areas are is very, very critical. And then having third party support to ultimately develop those metrics is critical too. One thing we never did from an ADM perspective is come up with our own metrics. We started with Field to Market, which is a consortium of like 30 different ag companies from ag tech to far farmer commodity agencies to ag processors to ag retailers 
um, and then um, had their focus on um, building those metrics out for us. And they did cover a lot of different categories. They covered biodiversity, I think their eight, their eight metrics are water quality, biodiversity, land use, greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, soil erosion, and soil carbon. Um, uh, in trying to understand, A, what benchmarks are of that region, and also of each practice, how to like assign a quantity uh, to it. Not all of it is like quantitative, some of, of it is qualitative, and that's just what we're gonna have to be at this point. But when you have that third party organization, they can focus on looking at research and talking to commodity agencies and talking to universities. Um, they can really build a, you know, what is a um, pretty reliable third party like calculator or metric for you. Because within that, they also developed a field print calculator. And on the edible dry bean side, like, there, isn't, ha there hasn't been as much time or focus that has been spent as you've seen like on the corn soy wheat side, that's the same on ours. So it takes a little bit more work, but it, ultimately it's gonna be more intimate when it's all said and done. Because um, it is a small group that's ultimately working with each other. So that's what we've started with just on the edible bean side. And then field to market is an open source. We always like lean towards open source as well to where it's not just ADM that can ultimately follow these metrics. Um, everybody's kind of speaking the same language, even though that's a little bit of a pipe dream in this space, because there's like a million different models and methodologies that are associated with it, but the closer you can get to standardize, the better. Um, but once that's ultimately been developed, um, then it kind of gives you a starting point. And really, that's like the technical component to it. The easiest part is having conversations with your farmers. What are you doing now? What are you thinking about? Um, what makes little sense? What's the hurdles that are offsetting it? What financial incentive can we give to help you offset those? Let's try it at a small scale, Let's see if it works. And it's not gonna be solved in one year. This has gotta be a long-term partnership. It's gotta be a three year, five year, seven year partnership. And that's where we've had the most success. The model's gonna be needed because we all need to be able to speak to whoever we're speaking to about a third party model that we're using. But where all the work actually comes from is um, sitting down and talking to farmers about what works and what doesn't work. Appreciate the question. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Uh, so then I wanted to talk about a little bit of what our, if anybody's not familiar or hasn't signed up for a uh, regenerative agriculture program or a carbon program, I'm gonna speak of what the process is. From our perspective, I'm not speaking for every program, but I'm gonna speak for ours. Um, a little bit of a difference between carbon credits and then our regener regenerative agriculture program. Uh, carbon credits ultimately are a credit asset that can be passed on to any company uh, within any country. It doesn't have to be tied to a supply chain whatsoever. There is a positive carbon benefit to the practice that you ultimately implemented. It can be given to a bank, can be given to a technology company, can be given to anybody. Supply chain insets, uh, which is what our regenerative agriculture programs are slightly different. They stay within the supply chain. It comes with different rules, different requirements. Um, but ultimately, they're positive environmental impacts that are first attached to your edible dry beans that pass throughout the whole system to make that can of beans um, differentiated from a carbon perspective, from water quality perspective, from a biodiversity perspective. So subtle difference between the two. If you get nerdy and you want to look at the technical terms, there's pretty significant differences between the both. But what we do are supply chain inset type of programs. And the first thing that we do is an analysis of a region that we think there's a market opportunity. So whether that's a downstream customer that's interested in standing up a program or a market that we can ultimately execute in, what we do is try to analyze what that supply shed region ultimately is. It's one thing we're, uh, we're really good at. We understand where we buy our commodities, we buy our grain. We have pretty good visibility, both upstream and downstream, of how um, the grain moves through. Um, but the first thing we start on, which is analysis of both the commodity and the region that we're sourcing from. Once we do that, we design a program. Always includes um, um, uh, incentives associated with practices. Uh, they can range. Uh, most of them are uh, payments per acre. It can be $5, it can be $25 uh, per acre. Uh, a lot of them can be stacked. Uh, a lot of them, we have multiple commodities that we're incentivizing. Some of them are uh, per bushel premiums as well. Uh, on the corn and soy side, uh, there's per bushel premiums for bushels that are ultimately delivered to our location. Again, can be stacked onto our practice payments as well. Um, uh, but once we design the program, then, um, um, then we create like our enrollment process for farmers. And usually there's an initial enrollment process. Uh, could be a website, 
uh, could be a PDF form, depending on which commodity it ultimately is. Uh, that's where, to where you guys can enroll in the program. It asks you some general questions about how many acres you farm, what practice you're looking to implement. Uh, we have been really flexible on some of the practices, understanding that weather happens, and uh, even with best efforts, sometimes you can't execute it. It's not as rigid as you would see a grain contract ultimately is. Uh, but there are um, details, once you enroll, of uh, what the agreement includes, what the payment ultimately is. After you enroll, uh, we have uh, usually a consultation. That's usually when we'll have a technical assistance partner that's helping us. It can come in several different forms. Most of it's one-on-one -on -one conversation if you have any questions. Um, if you have a robust fertilizer efficiency program, what are, you, what are you worried about? What are your concerns? If you want to plant a cover crop, there's a question around seeding rate, seeding type, termination date, et cetera. Uh, that's where they can answer those questions. Or it doesn't have to be a one-on-one -on -one consultation. They can just be a resource when a question arises. Um, after that, there's the data collection piece. Uh, that's the important piece. I have one of my colleagues that shares, um, usually a question comes up about being able to give that data. Uh, what it reminds me of like grade school math. Whenever you get asked a question, sometimes you couldn't just put the answer. You'd still get it correct if you didn't show your work um, of how you ultimately got there. And I think that's a pretty good example of this space as well uh, of showing work. Now we take data security very, very seriously. Uh, without secure data, uh, everything falls apart. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we've partnered with FBN as well, is we have cloud vetted their system. Uh, we know it intimately, um, and they're one of the most secure technology partners that we can have. Most platforms that you talk to, they're going to say that. There are third party like verifications of how secure their data is. I would just suggest looking at that on all of them. Uh, but that process usually is relatively quickly, and it just it depends on uh, how much of the information you have available. Also, if you happen to have like other, other platforms where that information is stored, whether it's John Deere Ops, whether it's Climate, um, or some other platforms, and it's pretty easily integrated. Um, but if you have all the information just available in PDFs or, or physical copies, it can be done relatively quick quickly too. Usually takes an hour, but sometimes it is multiple conversations if you guys don't have everything ready at first, but should be relatively easy. Uh, once that's done, we usually do um, a couple different verification steps. We have a QA, QC process. I say we, FBN does this for us. Uh, they call it their quality assurance, quality control. Sometimes misentered information happens. You know, we'll identify in the state of Illinois that someone put that they didn't put manure. If they only had like 50 pounds of nitrogen and somehow yielded 250 bushel corn, it will throw up a red flag that something is wrong. We need to follow up several different pieces of QA, QC, and then ultimately there's usually a verification process of practices as well using satellite imagery of confirming emergence uh, or tillage practices as well. Uh, once that's done, um, then ultimately we have payment that, uh, that follows uh, at the end of the year as well. Um, the one thing that's a little bit different about our programs than you might hear in other programs as well, some of the feedback that we got really early, um, a lot of a lot of the requirements were multi-year, it was five years, it was 10 years, and the feedback we got from farmers is it's pretty tough to swallow, um, knowing that, you know, might not own all the land, might be on a two-year lease, might be on a one-year lease, uh, that it's pretty hard to sign up for a five-year or 10-year commitment. So all of our contracts are one-year commitments as well, understanding that, uh, the things could change on your end. That being said, in our early days, we've seen a lot of success on getting multi-year agreements, uh, even though it's just one year at a time. We just have to win you guys' business every single year, making sure the process is easy, making sure we're competitive from a payment standpoint. Um, uh, and then um, another uh, pretty big component of all of our programs is we, in, we, we uh, incentivize early adopters uh, in some capacity as well. We think that's really critical uh, in a lot of practices. It's one of my, uh, if you want to get me on a tangent, it's one of my frustration points of a lot of these carbon markets um, is that requirement of additionality on a cover crop that only 6.5% of the U.S. land ultimately has um, when we need to lean on the early adopters, not necessarily... Um, um, I isolate uh, a lot of those farmers as well. So most of the time we have incentives for early adopters as well. Um, that's the process uh, of a lot of our programs. Um, the last thing before I maybe open it up for some questions is um, I wanted to give an update on what we're doing on the edible dry bean side. 
So we have finalized our USDA grant of which they had funding available to create the metrics that were talked about a little bit earlier on the field to market side. That work has begun. We're hoping it gets done by uh, June. Uh, there will be some survey questions that, uh, that, our, that our team might ask some of the farmers as well. Uh, we're looking for help, any volunteers to help us build this program across the whole industry. We're excited to have that conversation. Hopefully this time I get invited next year as well and we can talk about formal programs that are being offered out there. Um, uh, and But there's a lot of work to do here in the next six to eight months. Uh, and the last is just like a, a call to action that I would just have is um, if you're skeptical, understandably skeptical, there's a lot of noise around this space. Um, and uh, But it does feel like the overall trends are pretty significant and that consumers, and I know the panel is going to talk about this a little bit more about what their company's uh, commitments are and what consumer trends are, but consumers are looking for a little bit more transparency in their supply chain and I think there's two different ways you can think about that. There's one, there's the concern of, well, they don't need to worry about how we farm. Um, but the second point I think is more important. All the good work that you guys have done over the last 40 years, I just wish consumers knew more about that. That's part of what we try to accomplish is that storytelling that I know the next 40 years is going to be awesome as well. And it's only going to create a really big opportunity for the agriculture industry uh, to differentiate itself from other ingredients that you ultimately find on the shelves. Um, that's going to end mine, but I will uh, open it up in case there's any questions. I promise not to go over, and I do have seven minutes left. So, are there any questions in the crowd? Someone over here? Oh, yep. Got one over here. Do you have the incentive for the inset at all your origination points or just at certain ones right now? Oh, good question. Um, right now, I couldn't tell you how many total locations we have across the U.S. My guess would be roughly 220. We have programs offered at roughly 60 of those locations. And sometimes it's not even at the specific location. Sometimes it's statewide as well. So it's going to represent a little bit more than what just 60 locations are. So sometimes there are, we do have programs where you don't absolutely have to sell us uh, any of the commodities. You could potentially still be in the program. So it's a little bit more than 60 of the locations. But it's growing drastically. That was 10 locations two years ago, three years ago. The, the place that you can find it is admadvantage.com. Um, it'll have a whole breakdown of what our offerings are by state, by commodity. Um, our enrollment period did just end, I want to say it was December 1st. Usually it opens up in June, but we plan on opening it up way earlier this year. I expect it to be live in the next 30 days uh, for what 2024 offerings are. Uh, and you can find that there. And then there's, um, there's a pretty good um, resource of showing like multiple programs out there as well. I'm forgetting the name of it today. That isn't just ADM programs, but is other programs that are similar. I'm forgetting what it is. I think it's ISSAP has like a whole PDF of everybody else's program. That's always good to check as well. The one thing about this space is it's not as transparent as the, the grain marketing space. You can find bids from every different organization in several different places. We have it out there. It's just nobody accumulates it all that well. Uh, but that's where you can find our programs. Appreciate the question. Any other questions? Okay. I'll be around. Uh, if, if you want to come up and chat with me, um, feel free to just grab me. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>